What's going on? This is Ryan with Automatic Comics, and up next we are going to talk about 10 comic buying tips I wish I knew when I started. Stay tuned. Alright, so before we get started, please remember to hit that like button and hit the subscribe button if you'd like to see more content like this. So I had created a comic selling video a few weeks ago, and so I thought video on buying would also be useful because for one thing, I'm a little newer into the hobby than probably a lot of people. I did collect a lot when I was a kid, but then I got back seriously into it about two and a half or, or three years ago or so. So I think I've picked up a lot of these things more recently, and so my mistakes are a little more fresh in my memory. And so I thought it was something that might be useful to both new collectors and established collectors that maybe have gotten into a little bit of a rut in how they do their comic buying. So with that, let's get into these 10 things I wish I knew when I had first started buying comics. And now the first one is there are tons of places to buy comics. And this is very similar to what I talked about with selling comics. There's lots of places to sell comics. People typically get into kind of a rut and they will only buy comics from one place or two places and not really go and look at other options. And there are tons of places out there. And the more places you look, the more comics you might find, the more deals you might find, that kind of thing. And so when I first got into buying comics, really the only place I was aware of was either you know going to like an LCS or eBay. I wasn't familiar with any of the comic auction sites or and a lot of the the buying apps that are available now weren't available. I definitely wasn't on IG. Uh, so you've got like I said lots of options. eBay is a great place to start. There's a lot of books out there. Uh, there's a lot of variety and despite what people say there are good sellers <laughs> as well. Um, but then you've got Instagram. Instagram has a great comic community and there are a lot of people that do live claim sales, posted claim sales, um, just all kinds of things like that, live auctions. Then you've got the big, I'll call them comic auction houses, like Heritage that I talk about on a weekly basis with their weekly comic auction. You've got Comic Link that has auctions always going on. You've got Comic Connect, which has a big auction usually about once a month or so. And you've got another auction house called Hakes, which every few months will have a comic specific auction. Then you've got some apps like Shortboxed, where they have slabs that are available for you to scroll through and purchase. You've got Whatnot, which is the uh, basically kind of like a live auction app that's started up. And they don't just sell comics, but you've got a variety of collectibles and different things people sell on there. Then there's other places like YouTube, people doing live sales on YouTube. Then you've got places where you're actually going in, you know, meeting people in person. You've got comic conventions, you've got an LCS, you've got things like garage sales, antique stores. And so there are all kinds of options out there. So just if you've gotten maybe into a rut where you're only buying comics from one place or you're trying to figure out where else you can find them, tons of options out there for you. All right, now number two. This is one I think is very important to learn to help control yourself on some of these uh, and some comic purchases. It's been very helpful for me. And this is, there will almost always be another copy of that book available. Now, the reason I say almost is there could be a very rare example of where you get into things like golden age books, very rare, rare variants, things like that, where maybe you won't see that book come up for sale again for a year or two years. Now that doesn't mean you won't have an option, an opportunity again. They, like I said, I mean, it's pretty rare that you can have a book that never comes up for sale again, but you could end up waiting a year or more for some of these more rare books. But once you understand that there are thousands of a lot of these big key issues out there, it helps that you, when you pass on something, not to really think too much about it and think, okay, I'll probably see another copy of this book come up, same grade, same page quality, everything, and I'll have a chance to buy it then. Or you might find a book that's even a better grade that you end up finding a better price on. So that's a big thing, is just understanding that there are plenty of books out there and passing on something does not mean you will never get that book again. So when you're in, say, an auction on eBay or Heritage or anything like that, Pick your price and stick to it. If it doesn't work out, then just let it go and you will find another book. Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of 
unboxings, different books, and everything like that, and I am always sticking to my price. Now, I generally have a, a range that I'll be willing to accept, but if it gets outside of that, I, I will not buy that book. I've made one exception, and that was something for a very, very rare book, and it's just a book that I had never seen come up for sale before, and I haven't seen come up for sale since. I'm sure it will again sometime, but I, I made that decision to go a little outside of my comfort zone on that book and decided to pick it up. But as I said, like it is very rare that those types of examples are going to come up. Now, for me, early on, I did make a few mistakes <laughs> in this area. I had bought a Silver Surfer 4 and a Batman 181 on eBay and it was an auction and I just, I, I got, you know, I really wanted those books and I just ended up paying a little too much for them. Now, luckily, the comic market eventually caught up to the prices I paid, uh, but it, it it's not guaranteed. You, you know, you could be the person that pays the most ever for that book, and you're the person that paid the most ever for that book for all time. <laughs> so, um, so, so yeah, it is. I think it's important to stick to your prices and just understand that there will be other books available. All right, number three. And this is one that I think is just helpful if you're really just getting into comics for the first time or early on. And this is stick with the obvious key issues. And so if you have a characters that you like, focus on those characters, but figure out what the key issues are for that character and buy those. And the reason I say that is that, yes, it might cost you more to get into those more key or important issues. However, if you decide that comics aren't for you, it's something you don't want to stick with, those are the issues that are going to be easy to sell that you can get out of, you know, and then you're not having a bunch of money sunk into books that are very difficult to sell. And so that's why I would say stick to the key issues for the characters that you really like, at least at the start. If you find that then you really enjoy the hobby, you really like buying different books, that kind of thing, then you can expand out into other books. Um, so I, I started with kind of an, some kind of obscure books. I mean, like I said, I did buy some some bigger keys like the Batman 181 and Silver Surfer 4, but I also bought a book called Amazing Adventures Number One, which, I mean, it's a it's kind of a minor key, but took a long time for me to end up selling that book. There's not a huge amount of demand for it, and so if you had been someone that decided you weren't going to be interested in comics longer term, that could have been something that you're you know you spend a bunch of money on that you're you're stuck with. So. Try to stick with those obvious keys. Now, depending on your budget, there's all kinds of ranges of books that you could get. And I've seen people that have started off buying really high-end books. They just, that's what they decided to go for at the beginning. I'd say there's basically different tiers that you could start with. So you've got things like six-figure tier books where it's Batman 1, Tech 27, Action 1, Marvel Comics 1, that kind of thing. Then you've got five-figure books, books that are over 10,000. I'm, I'm talking about mid-grades for these like X-Men 1, Fantastic Four 1, AF-15, Showcase 4, the types of books that I talked about in my top 10 Silver Age list. Then you've got four-figure books, books that are in that $1,000 to $9,000 range. There's things like Fantastic Four 48, First Silver Surfer, Hulk 181, First Wolverine, Amazing Spider-Man 129, First Punisher, books like that that are big keys in that $1,000 range. Then you can move down into the $100 range, and there are tons of keys in this range for big characters. You've got books like Fantastic Four Annual Six, which is the first Denialist and first Franklin Richards, so big spec book. You've got Batman 251, the, the big key issue for Joker, a big turning point in Joker. Amazing Spider-Man 300, the first Venom. X-Men 266, the first Gambit. New Mutants 98, the first Deadpool. Thor 165, the first Adam Warlock. Looks like that that you can get in the price range of hundreds of dollars that are gonna be in very high demand. I think those are great books to start with. Again, find characters you're interested in and look for the key issues for those characters to start. If you then find that you like building runs, you can expand into that, but I would start with the keys. Now for number four, and I think this one might be a little bit controversial, but I think this is really good, especially if you're just starting to get into comics. And this is start with a graded book. And now I recommend going with a book, you know, if you're new, new to, to comics, like a CGC book, this is Amazing Spider-Man 129 that I mentioned earlier, First Punisher. So CGC, you, know, you can see the name up here. Or uh, one of my favorite books that I have, you could go for CBCS. And this is Wonder Woman number one. You can see it's a, a CBCS graded book. And so you can see I buy both CGC and CBCS. I mean, just 
depends on the price and the, and the book. I, I will buy from, from either. I'm not an acolyte for, for one versus the other. I definitely have more CGC books. Uh, however, I do also buy CBCS books. Now, I recommend both of those just because they are going to be the easiest to sell, again, if you decide you're not interested in comics uh, after you've gotten into it a little bit and they're just, it's easier to sell a graded book than a raw book. Now, the other big reason I recommend graded books is that it takes out that need to be able to grade a book yourself. Now, people can argue that, yeah, maybe the book is a 7.5 or an 8 or, or something like that uh, if they don't agree with the grade provided by CGC or CBCS, but it's still going to be something that's close to what that book represents. Whereas if you're buying a raw book, uh, you can pay way too much sometimes, and I see that a lot out there where people pay too much for books that are, that are said to be a certain grade and they aren't. And so this takes that out of the equation. So if you've got a graded book, you know what you're getting and you're not potentially picking up something that's restored or overgraded or, or that kind of thing. Now I've made plenty of mistakes early on when I was buying raw books and, and that's why I'm saying this. I, I started in with raw books and I kind of wish maybe I would have started with graded so I could learn grading a little better. And that Batman 181 I got, uh, it ended up it was it was not the grade that was advertised and so it had a you know partially detached centerfold and, and things like that that weren't disclosed on the listing and so just if you don't know how to grade i think it's much easier to start with a graded book all right now number five and i mentioned this when i was talking about selling books as well and it's pay for a pricing service whether that's go collect or gpa or cover price any of these pay for one of these pricing services what these pricing services do is they grab sales from ebay from those auction houses and they consolidate them into one spot and they give you approximate prices for different grades of those books and this doesn't mean that you have to pay exactly that price or you can't pay over that price or under that price but it gives you an idea of approximately what you should reasonably be paying for that book, what that book is worth at that moment in time. And I think too many people want to use the, the free version, you know, for example, of Go Collect, where it doesn't give them any of the actual detailed sales, but you're saving, what, $5, $6 to potentially then spend hundreds of dollars more on a book. I would, I would just say, if you're spending at least $100 on a book, it is, worthwhile to get one of these pricing services. It will pay for itself within a single purchase. Now you can go the way of just looking at past eBay sales, but there's a lot less data there. It only goes back usually about three months. And so I would personally recommend just paying for one of these pricing services. They are worth their weight in gold when you're talking about buying comics. All right, now number six, and this one is one that will take a little bit longer. However, it's learn to grade. You don't need to become a professional. You don't need to be spot on, you know, exactly every single time, but just learn what an approximate grade is for these books. And it can definitely take some time. It's not something that's easy. It's taken me some time. It's really helped that I buy so many graded books. It helps me really see what goes into each one of these grades. There's also a lot of resources out there. For example, I've mentioned his channel a number of times. ETA Nick has tons and tons, just hours of grading videos where he goes over each grade, each half grade, what to expect in those grades. He talks about things like restoration, all of that. And so go check out resources like that and, and really learn how to grade. Now, I would not recommend necessarily grading based off of Overstreet. And so yes, you can buy the Overstreet price guide and they have in there grading guidelines. However, CGC and CBCS do not follow those grading guidelines. You will have very different grades <laughs> for coming from CGC and CBCS versus what you would expect if you strictly followed Overstreet. That's why a resource like ETA Nick is very useful because he is grading the way that CGC grades because that's who he submits to. And so that's really the standard you want to understand if you're talking about getting books graded by one of these companies. And that's generally what people are really expecting when they're buying a book from you. If you say it's a six, it's not that it's a six per Overstreet, it's that it's a six per CGC or CBCS. 
So as you've gotten into comics and say you've bought some graded books, you decide this is something you really like, this is definitely an area that is worth investing your time into. Now number seven, this one is related to grading and it's do not trust the grades that people give you when they are selling you their books. Now this can be on eBay, this can be on Instagram, this can be on YouTube, it can be anywhere. If someone tells you that a book is a certain grade, trust your own eyes, do not trust what the person says. There are definitely people out there that are great graders, but there are a lot more people out there that are not great graders. And you may think that it's just people that are new to comics, that kind of thing, it is not. There are very established dealers, comic shops that do not know how to grade their books or they grade maybe by Overstreet, not by how CGC does it. And that will cost you a lot of money when you go to submit that book to get graded and find out that, oh, you got a 4-0 instead of a 6-0 that somebody sold you the book as. And this really is critical to know how to do this if you are getting into buying raw books. There's just too many mistakes that can be made, too many things where people can take advantage of other people if they don't know how to grade. And so I just, I, I know it is a daunting task, but I really do recommend learn how to grade because then you can trust your own eyes when you're buying books from someone, not necessarily what they're saying. And so on eBay, for example, you can see lots of pictures. You've got stills, you can zoom in on them. If you know how to grade, you can generally get a very good estimate of what that book is gonna come back as, assuming it's not missing some piece from the inside or something like that. But on places like Instagram, YouTube, you're, you're not getting a clear picture of that book. You have to take that person's word for it. And so what I do uh, typically is I will buy, I'll call them test books from that person. And so the first time I'm buying from them, I might buy one or two books that I'm interested in. And then when I get those books in, I will evaluate the book myself compared to the grade they told me it was. And so that's how I'll start to see if I think that their grading aligns with what I think is accurate, or if I think maybe they overgrade, or if I think they undergrade. And I will adjust how much I will pay for those books based on that assessment. And so that doesn't mean that if somebody overgrades their books that they're necessarily a, a bad seller or anything like that. It's just you need to be aware of that, that if somebody, say, generally overgrades their books by a full grade, then when you are looking at prices for the books they're selling, assume it's a grade lower. These are just reasonable things to do when you are purchasing books so that you don't end up getting burned further down the line if you're ultimately the one that's sending that book in to get graded. Now I've got a couple examples of this and these are some books that I saw on eBay so I just snapped a couple pictures. This isn't something where I'm trying to call out the seller or anything like that. Uh, this was just that they graded this book and people paid the prices based on the grade that was provided. But if you actually looked closely at the book you realize that these grades were very inaccurate. Uh, this first one here was graded as a 6-0. And you can see just based on this one picture that I'm gonna put up over here, uh, this book is not a 6-0. Uh, it is probably closer to a 3-5, but a 6-0 approximately price was paid for that book. And so if someone sends that book in, they are going to be very disappointed when they get that book graded. Now, another one was a book that was graded as an 8-5. And I've got that picture up over here. And you can see there's this stain down in the bottom uh, corner of the front cover. It's not very obvious on the front of the book if you looked at the front of the book, but once the person showed the inside of the cover, you can see that that book is not an 8.5. There's a 0% chance that book is getting an 8.5. That book might be around a 6 because it's really clean otherwise, maybe, maybe a 6. And so those are examples of things where people will pay based on what somebody advertises a grade as, and if they knew how to grade, then they would not have paid that amount of money and they would have saved themselves some heartache further down the line. All right, now number eight, and this is when you buy a raw book, the first thing you should do when that book shows up is flip through that book. Check the interior, make sure that there aren't any cutouts, uh, look for anything that seems like it does not match what you paid for. Do page counts. Make sure that everything is there. There are plenty of times when I have received books that were sold as complete that ended up having cutouts from them, missing pages, and these are not from just unknown 
people on eBay. If you watch one of my unboxings from it's probably a few months ago when I got a Fantastic Four Annual number two, it was missing eight full pages, eight pages. And this person sold that book as complete. And when I reached out to them, they tried to kind of make me feel bad about it where they were like, I told you it was low grade. They sold it as a 1.5. A 1.5 is a complete book. Maybe it could have one cut out. That book would have been incomplete 0.5 all day. And so that's where no matter how big of a dealer somebody is, you don't trust what something is sold as. You always check yourself. And I haven't bought from that person again. And I probably will never buy from that person again. Where I've had other people that have sold me books that have issues like that, and they've handled it very professionally. And I continue to buy books from them. So it really, you don't necessarily have to cut someone off just because you have a bad experience like that with a book. It depends how they handle it after the fact. All right, now number nine. This one, again, can be difficult, but it is very valuable at least to learn some of the easy ones, and that is learn to spot obvious restoration. And there are definitely more difficult types of restoration to spot, but picking up the obvious ones will help you most of the time. And so I've got a few examples here to try to help with that. And so the first one is color touch. And so color touch generally is the most easy to spot. And this book was sold to me knowing that it had color touch on it. So, I mean, I'll buy books with restoration. It's not a big deal. Um, but so this is uh, Mystery in Space number 35. And you can kind of see it in the light right there, some of the color touch already. It's uh, right here on this crease. And you can see where it's a slightly different shade from the other black around it. So that shows up very qu quickly and easily. Um, the other way that you can generally see where this color touch is, is on the inside cover. And so you can see it, that one didn't bleed through much. There's a little bit if you get, if you get really close, but uh, up along the spine, you can see that right where the staple is, that black, that's where there's color touch. There's black Sharpie probably that was used and it bled through into the inside of the, the cover. And that's one of the things that you really want to look for with color touch. Now, if you suspect color touch, one of the things that I've learned that works really, really well is if you use your phone and you put it up against the, the book, you can then zoom in, you know, use the digital zoom or whatever in very, very close to the cover. And you can see each one of the individual dots of ink on the cover. And you can see where something will look different, where it looks like it's not the color created by those dots. You'll see a streak or something like that. And so I just found a phone is an extremely good tool for following in closer if you suspect there's some types of color touch, because not all color touch will bleed through. If it's professional, or usually if it's even uh, the B level color touch between amateur and professional, it generally won't bleed through. And so that's where you need to look, you know, where I was showing where it was a different color when you, when you looked at it in the light, you could see a difference in color in that black. That's the type of thing that you would look for there. Uh, now, another type of restoration that's generally pretty easy to spot is glue. And so uh, this is a book that I've shown recently. And again, it was sold knowing that there was restoration on it. And this one has glue on the spine. And this is Haunt of Fear number 15. And now with glue on the spine, it may not be something that you can obviously see. This one, you can kind of see that there's this tinting along the spine. That's That could just be dirt or, or tanning. But if you go into the book, you see how, let's see here. You see how the pages are are kind of stuck they aren't opening fully that's how you know there there's an issue there that there's there's some glue there uh, a black light might also help it show up but you can see how this is kind of sticking to that to that page and so that tells you there's as long as there's no tape right there that that might be doing that you can tell that there's probably been glue added to that spine to help keep the cover on and again not a big deal if it's something that that you knew about when you're you're buying the book. Now another uh, one that's can be it, it may or may not be restoration, but it's just something to be aware of. This one 
I'm not sure if this will come back as restored or not. I, I can't tell. It wasn't sold restored, but I'm a little concerned that it might be. Not a big deal because it's still a rare book and I'm you know, happy to have it. So this is Haunt of Fear number 17. This is another book I picked up recently. And on this one, so you can see there's, uh, there's tape on the spine. But the difference is that the staples are on the outside of the tape. And so what that tells you is that at least the staples were removed at some point to add tape to the cover and then reattach the cover. So likely it was a pop staple where a staple has torn through the cover and somebody wanted to reattach it. And so they, uh, they, put, they pulled the staples, they put tape on the spine, and then they put the staples back in. However, uh, I'm not sure if they're the original staples or not. And if they're not the original staples, then that would come back as either restored or conserved. And so that's one where I'm not 100% sure what that one's gonna come back as, but that's another thing you can look for is if those staples are on the outside of the tape or the inside of the tape, it tells you that there's the potential that those staples have been replaced. And uh, just another color touch example, this is my, and you know this one's restored because it's a purple label. Um, this is my world's finest number three, which is first appearance of Scarecrow. And again, you can see in that light, look for those, those creases. And if you see creases where you'd expect there to be white, but you don't see white, uh, that usually means that there's color touch there. And so there's all kinds of little creases on this cover, but there's not a lot of white. And especially down in that corner, for example, you can see there's a big, what would be a color breaking crease, but it looks dark green. It's because somebody colored over that. And so those are the types of things that really will jump out quickly. You know, color breaking creases that aren't breaking color, staples that are on top of, of tape, um, you know, glue on the spine where, where things are, where pages are sticking. Those are all kinds of things that can be signs of restoration. And again, it's not necessarily a bad thing, especially for these rarer golden age books, these expensive books. Restoration is pretty common because they've been around for a long time, but it does impact the value of that book. So it is important to be able to identify at least some of those types of restoration that are a little easier. All right, and number 10, and I think this is just something that needs to be said every once in a while. It is supposed to be fun. <laughs> we are collecting comics. We are collecting expensive paper. These are comic book characters, cartoon characters, this kind of thing. It, it does not need to be a fight or an argument over all the little minutia that people get worried about with comics. Um, you know, if somebody likes CGC versus CBCS versus raw books, let them like those types of books. You don't have to attack them or shame them or make them feel bad for what they like to collect. If somebody wants to buy certain hot books, certain variants, uh, the, the new hot key versus old established books, let them do that. You know, let people buy the books that they want to buy. Uh, that's what this is about. It's supposed to be fun. And we want to make sure that the hobby continues into the future. We want to make sure that any of these new people that have started getting into comics over the last year, that they want to stick with the hobby, that they want to keep doing this. And by getting angry with people, shaming people for what they do, that does nothing to help the hobby. So just remember that. It's supposed to be fun. All right, so those are my 10 tips that I wish I knew when I first started buying comics. Uh, if you enjoyed this, please hit that like button. Please hit the subscribe button if you'd like to see more content like this. I've got videos over here if you'd like to watch some of my other videos and the subscription button right here if you'd like to subscribe to the channel. I'd really appreciate it. And I will see you in the next video.